Dr. Dr. Panjit Singh has been involved in the private higher education and technology sectors for the past 40 years. He's the co-founder and CEO of the APIIT Education Group, which includes the Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU, and the Asia Pacific Institute of Information Technology, APIIT. In addition, he currently holds the following positions as the Pro Chancellor of Staffordshire University, United Kingdom, President of Malaysian Association of Private Colleges and Universities, MAPCU, the President of Malaysian Service Providers Confederation, MSPC, the member of Advisory Committee, Ministry of Higher Education, Malaysia. Please welcome Dato Dr. Panjit Singh. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, all right, let's get on to uh, our, our session right now, and I'll just give you some opening remarks. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished uh, panel members, colleagues, the organizing committee, and, uh, and all of our audience who are online right now. I mean, as we know, TVET has been a constantly debated topic in Malaysia. In this context, I quote our prime minister, um, currently the caretaker prime minister, that TVET should not be seen as second class education for dropouts and, or less brilliant students. You know, there's always a notion that uh, TVET is um, uh, uh, second class. Um, TVET education is the core of the country's human resource development. It goes towards ensuring that we always have a new skill force that's continuously churned out, especially in the fields that are critical to the development and progress of our country. In fact, the need for skills is more apparent now in the age of digitalization and IR 4.0. Tools and techniques, technologies, for example, in manufacturing, automotive, aviation, and many other technical trades utilize more complex and smart technologies than ever before. Therefore, we can see that TVET graduates play a key role in fulfilling the requirements of these industries and it contributes to nation building. We have seen successful examples of technical and vocational education systems in countries such as Japan, Germany, and Australia uh, through the TAFE colleges, to name a few. Technical graduates are very much sought after and are also well paid in these countries. It is time now for Malaysian TVET to rise to the occasion. To address some of these developments and challenges in a global and in particular the local context, we have three distinguished panel members each with substantial experience in their domain of knowledge pertaining to TVET. I would like to first introduce Dr. Junichi Mori. Um, Junichi Mori is currently the Chief Technical Advisor of the International Labor Organization, uh, in short, ILO, for Skills for Prosperity Southeast Asia Program based in Malaysia. As a researcher of the National Graduate Research Institute for Policy Studies, he facilitated policy-oriented research for the formulation of the industry master plans in Vietnam. As an industrial development officer of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, which is in short also known as UNIDO, he formulated and implemented projects in the fields of green industries, trade facilitation, and corporate social responsibilities. His recent career focuses on industrial engagement in technical and vocational education and training. That's Tiwet. As an expert of the Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, he contributed to the development of the sustainable system to upgrade training programs. He has a master's degree from the Fletcher School, uh, Tufts University in the USA, and also a PhD from Cardiff in the UK. 
Um, next, I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Thomas Schroeder. Um, he is the director, Institute of General and Vocational Education, and also chair of the International Cooperation in Education and Tibet Systems. He is also the holder of the UNESCO Chair for Tibet and Competence Development for the Future of Work at TU Dortmund University. He has vast experience in designing and managing projects in Tibet in the higher education sector in Germany, Europe, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and also been in policy advisory. He provided technical advisory services for governments and implemented systemic innovation at the implementation level. He's also the founder of the Regional Association of Vocational and Technical Education in Asia, and also the editor-in-chief of TVET at Asia. Professor Schroeder's, Schroeder's specific research and development interests are the analysis of TVET systems, the dual TVET system, work-based learning and vocational didactics, the education of TVET personnel in the context of 21st century. Finally, but not least, I would like to introduce Ms. Sasha Radnam. She is the co-founder of Tech Terrain College, Malaysia which I understand is a substantial operation with more than 1,200 trainees. As a co-founder, she has been awarded the title of the National Apprenticeship Expert by the British Council, with a mission to provide a brighter future for young Malaysians. She focuses on the delivery of innovative TVAT diploma programs that are hands-on and industry-focused with no SPM requirements. Over the last 18 years, the college has graduated over 5,000 Malaysians with TVET qualifications and successfully placed them with their 250 industry partners. Over a decade of experience in TVET implementation and apprenticeships, Sasha is passionate about the way education stays relevant in the 21st century. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are very fortunate to have three very eminent speakers with us this afternoon. Two with very wide international experience, and then Sasha, who can also provide us with local contacts. Having made the introductions, let's begin the session. I will now pose the panel with the first question, um, which we will take in turn from one speaker to another. I think we all agree that we recognize the importance of TVET to the workforce and also to our economy and society at large. Hence, the question, what are the challenges of making TVET a real catalyst in this era of the fourth industrial revolution? as well as the disrupted situation that we have of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can I ask Dr. Mori to first give us his perspective in this area? Thank you, Dr. Mori. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, your introduction, uh, Dr. Kupamjit. And then uh, very nice to see you, Sasha, and then Dr. Shiroda. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for the question. It's very interesting and very important. I think a point is how to train the people who can deal with the rapid change and the uncertainty in the age of the industry 4.0 and then like uh, digital technology development. I, from my perspective, there are the four main challenges. First challenge is about the learning ability of a Tibet student. In the age of the uncertainty, we need the ability to deal with the many unexpected issues uh, and then to adapt a new environment very quickly. But uh, the pro issue is uh, in general, uh, not only in Malaysia, but in many countries, the Tibet students and graduate often have uh, good practical skills, but uh, they tend to have a little bit lower learning ability than those from the higher education. That's, I think, are quite general challenges. 
So uh, because a TBET program tend to focus on a specific technical skills rather than the general skills or, uh, or the theoretical knowledge, that could be the one reason. So another issue could be that they are not trained to study continuously by themselves. For example, uh, I have a uh, many friend working uh, work in a manufacturing company in Japan or uh, Vietnam where I used to work many a long time. One of the general director of the Japanese manufacturing company said they try to train both higher education graduate and then Tibet graduate at the same time, provide that same uh, same training. But uh, the learning speed of the Tibet graduate and the higher education graduate are different because uh, of the learning skills. Like a higher graduate student uh, tend to study by themselves, but the Tibet student tend to wait for the guidance. That's uh, this difference. Uh, second challenge is equality and diversity. In order to deal with a rapid change and uncertainty, you need, to, you need to have a creativity supported by various ideas, and then often the ideas come from the people from various backgrounds who have a different angles. So uh, we promote uh, gender equality and then social inclusion at the ILO, but uh, this uh, inclusion equality is very important. For example, a female student may provide a different idea from the male student. Uh, in my previous job, I used to work as a J uh, Japan International Cooperation, uh, Cooperation Agency as a Tibet expert, and then I saw one female student of the Japanese Technical Colleges develop a system to detect the defect of the low-quality coffee beans uh, by using the machine learning of the uh, image, uh, color image of the coffee bean. So, of course, uh, I don't say like a uh, male student cannot do that, but simply like uh, they have a different idea. So it's very important to utilize the people from different backgrounds. However, despite the various efforts made by the government uh, and then the Tibet institutions in Malaysia, I see the equality and diversity are still not enough in a certain trade and then the training field. Uh, if I look at the enrollment rate, it seems uh, quite equal. But if I look at, uh, for example, like uh, enrollment rate by the sector, uh, it seems like uh, some trade or course, like uh, machining, construction, or automotive, or welding, those fields seem to be dominated by the male, although female have a good potential to uh, join this sector too. The third challenge is about the industry engagement in Tibet. Uh, thank you for that. Look for uh, that's the area I've been using. Uh, I've been working on because uh, I'm originally from a private sector. I used to work in a manufacturing company. I know, like Malaysian government, has been making a lot of the effort to promote the industry engagement. And then I saw some employers' organization, like a Malaysian Employer Federation, Federation of the Malaysian Manufacturer provide a lot of the useful information in developing a skilled standard and curricula. And then I saw like a Minister of Human Resources have a really good uh, mechanism called the industry-led bodies. However, uh, I, I think uh, industry is joining as uh, advisors, not as a leader. So since uh, Malaysia is becoming a higher income economies, the industry should ha have a stronger leadership in the skills development. The final point uh, is the skills demand itself. Uh, I've been working in the Tibet sector, let's say like us, uh, try to increase the skills supply in the various countries. But I often think the skills demand is very important too, because if companies don't require the skilled workforce, if we train many skilled workers, simply we are creating the overqualification or skills unutilization. So we need to stimulate the skills uh, uh, demand. Our project focuses on the two sectors, construction and food processing sector, but I see the difference of the skills demand. For example, when we talk about the industry uh, revolution, IR 4.0 technologies, in the food processing sector, I saw relatively lower demand for the higher technologies compared with the construction sector, because probably one of the reasons the sector is consists of the many small and medium enterprises. So, um, Thank you very much. My uh, answer become a bit uh, longer, but uh, basically I, uh, am, I, I see the four main challenges. Thank you very much. Over to you, Datuk. 
Thank you, Mr. Mori. Uh, what I found most interesting was the uh, differences between the male and female, uh, you know, traits that they take up. Uh, so very much um, uh, certain traits like welding, mainly uh, male dominated. I think that's what you said, yeah. And also very interesting to note from you that continuing education is something that lacks, yeah. Um, um, motivation wise, I suppose. Uh, or they're always looking for someone to come and teach them. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, Sasha, can I ask you to go next? Uh, because Dr. Schroeder, I think, is having difficulty getting on, yeah? Um, and again, no problem. we're talking about the challenges, yeah, Sasha? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Baramji. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mori, for your wonderful insight. Um, I'm going to be able to give insight in a more localized context. Now, over the last decade, I've been working in TVET and the implementation of um, not just policy, but actual recruitment of students and the implementation of our government and um, private diplomas in the technical vocational education and training sector. Now, of course, TVET is a catalyst to our Industry 4.0. We are in a situation right now where everyone is um, a little bit afraid as to what the future of our country, our, the future of our economy holds due to this pandemic that has um, unfortunately come against us. Now, the challenges of Tibet in Malaysia, um, I think, are also being faced by many other countries around the world. The first of it is the public perception of what Tibet is. A lot of people don't even understand what Tibet means. You know, they, they think, you know, I, I, this weird acronym and Malaysia loves the acronyms. We've got a million acronyms around Malaysia, but TVET is something that people are still not very used to. They don't know whether it is higher education. They don't know whether it's actually just vocational schools, technical schools. It's a little bit of a mumbo jumbo. So what has happened, I think, in our Malaysian technical landscape is that, that there is no clear um, definition to where the student can go and what, uh, what are their pathways moving forward. This is without COVID. Malaysians also are having the issue of the technical diplomas not being recognized the same way MQA diplomas are being recognized in the market. It's not just the job market, but also in the education industry. People think that TVET is meant for students who only didn't do well in SPM, so no problem, then you can go into a TVET sector. That's not the case. If TVET is going to be the main, um, main pillar of how our industries move forward into IR 4.0, we need to focus on TVET becoming a pillar of our education sector. Now, this needs to be done through the bridging of MQA and JPK, Jabatan Pembangunan Kemahiran, who is also the big boss of um, TVET diplomas. Not just the bridging, but also making sure that the graduates out of TVET diplomas can all go into university. Now, Dr. Mori brought up a very, very crucial point, which is the pathways of education for TVET isn't as simple as the academic pathways. A student who has done very well in SPM can walk into any university and know that from a diploma, he can transition seamlessly into a degree and then move without even an afterthought into a master's program into a PhD. However, unfortunately for our TVET students, we still have a little bit of a bridging process to be done where we have JPK diploma that are now, thankfully, are now being streamlined into making sure that our TVET graduates can move into higher education seamlessly as well. So I would like to congratulate the Education Ministry. That's something that we are working very hard to um, provide for our young Malaysians. Now, the COVID situation has brought an entire new uh, chapter into the higher education landscape, not just for TVET, but also for academic higher education. The unfortunate thing is in Malaysia, because of the availability of cheap labor from other countries, um, it has allowed our industries to kind of remain low skill and human centric. Processes that in other countries, like you said, you know, Germany, um, Singapore, even our neighbor, they have been forced to automate. They have been forced to look at TVET as the answer for making sure our young people become higher skilled so that machines can take the lower skilled jobs. This is something that COVID has forced our Malaysian industries to do because of the, the, the 
fact that our people can't go into the workforce. They have, we've all been shut down since 2020. TVET has become a situation where we need to digitalize. We need to make sure that the skills being taught in our universities itself can keep up with the automation that is required by our IR 4.0. So at the moment, these are some of the main um, deterrents that I see in our TVET sector. And of course, the problems that have the disruption that has been brought by COVID-19. Thank you, you, thank you, um, Sasha. Uh, uh, thank you so much. You have given us a local perspective and uh, very much uh, an area that I can resonate with, like, for example, public perception. Uh, but you've also said we, we have won the battle a little bit uh, on the qualification front, that uh, there's no progression from TVET to the, uh, there, there's an academic pathway from TVET. Yeah, and that's that's really good. So that uh, there is some semblance of recognition now. Yeah, uh, as one would say. Otherwise, it's always been related to be one that's a dead end. Yeah, and so forth. Um, you've also mentioned that technical diplomas, you know, generally uh, have less recognition than um, diplomas that are MQA accredited. Yeah, that's very very true. Cheap labor, that, that was an interesting point that you made. Yeah. And um, so, having said all this, um, let me see. Dr. Shorda is still not online. Um, okay. I, I would like to then put it back to um, Dr. Mori. Uh, from the challenges that you have outlined, uh, what do you think, uh, from a policy perspective, um, can be done to address these? Uh, that's first. And also, again, from an institutional perspective, how can TVET uh, or higher education institutions um, respond to address these challenges? And also from the public and student perspective, how can we shape public perception, especially students, to address these challenges? You know, these challenges of lack of recognition and um, um, you know they, they don't they don't enjoy the same um, uh, platform as tertiary students. Yeah. So Dr. Mori, maybe you can give us a perspective on these three areas. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. It's a huge question, but I try to answer, and then try to answer shortly. So uh, to begin with, uh, let me focus on the digital technology or IR 4.0. I think uh, um, we should not. We should be a uh, little careful uh, not to mystify our IR 4.0 technology. We should be aware that uh, some of the new technology there is a change, but uh, not to scare too much. I think uh, policy uh, policy makers provide a vision, so I think it's very really important uh, to make people aware of the difference, but also not to be scared because some technologies are new, but others are adaptation or application to existing technology. For example, like uh, regarding our automation technology, of course, like a uh, programming or machine learning is a uh, new, but like a uh, programmable logic controller, pneumatic, machinery maintenance, sensor, all are important. And then those are existing technology and skill. So also, uh, this will lead to the another point, but uh, when I visited the training center of the Lean Automation System Integrators in Thailand, run by the one Japanese uh, big automotive uh, parts manufacturer, it is promoting like automation IoT. I saw like uh, what they teach first is not like uh, automation technology, but the conventional productivity and quality improvement method because they said um, actually, the people need to learn like how to improve productivity and quality first. Otherwise, they cannot set up a proper automation line uh, effectively. So again, like uh, some are new, but again, some are the application of the existing technology. So let's not be too much afraid of that. That's uh, my message. Having said that, I uh, I have a several uh, 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 suggestion for the policy side. Our first proposal is uh, related to the, my comment on the learning ability. I think it is really important to strengthen the general skills or core, core skills in the IRO's term. 
which is include like a problem solving by group or logical thinking or like a mathematics, basic mathematics and scientific theories, like uh, also like a statistics and so on. Um, because uh, these skills will enable Tibet to graduate to not only get a job, but uh, con uh, to achieve a continuous career development. So I'm fully aware that like uh, relevant ministries in Malaysia are promoting uh, soft skills or core skills, like uh, uh, core competency under the National Occupational Skills Standard. But however, I think it is uh, important to further promote those core skills. Just for your information, ILO recently launched a global framework on the core skills for life, uh, life and work in the 21st century. Uh, later, I'll just post it uh, if you are interested. In. And then in Malaysia, uh, we, uh, our project supported by the UK government uh, try to promote the integration of the science, technology, engineering, mathematics skills into the Tibet and skills training. Yeah, uh, so that's why I um, just want to emphasize that the core skills are important. And then second issue is about the uh, mainstream, the gender equality and social inclusion in Tibet. For this, uh, for policy side, I think uh, it is important to promote a more flexible program. Uh, it's a bit difficult to explain all the detail, but uh, uh, basically uh, we recommend more modular programs uh, which allow the different people to join even in the short term, because probably, uh, uh, particularly the people in a vulnerable group or people in a remote area have a difficulty to join long-term training. So we should uh, provide a more flexible program to let uh, these people to join and then get the skills in a modular basis. And then uh, uh, that took all dimension, but uh, also it is necessary to reduce the gender bias uh, in uh, occupation or job selections. Um, for example, like a welding, machining, uh, construction tend to be uh, like a male dominated sector, but a female has a chance to uh, join uh, this sector and then to be a skilled workers. For example, I know like uh, there is a skilled operator for the electric discharge machine even though like a machining sector considered to be like a physically demanding job, but uh, still female can uh, be a skilled operator. In construction sectors, probably the technology change can give a more chance for female to join uh, uh, this uh, sector as a skilled workforce. For example, uh, the building information modeling, um, uh, this is a new technology too, but uh, probably female can be uh, skilled uh, engineers or technicians in utilizing this technology. Another technology could be a 3D printing. Um, sorry, I'm currently in Japan, but I saw uh, one news article, which is not nothing new, but uh, even in Japan, I saw like uh, the workforce in the construction sector will decrease from uh, 5 million in uh, 2017 to 3 million in 2040, yeah? So therefore, like uh, some big company try to utilize the 3D printing technology for construction sectors. So this technology may give a chance for more female workers to join this technology. So um, that's a po uh, my proposal for the policy side. I have uh, some more, but uh, maybe I just uh, try to save our time. And then uh, another issue is about the uh, institution side, uh, Tibet institutions, which I also used to work for. <laughs> so um, maybe the Ms. Sasha can give a more concrete idea, but uh, also let me make a few proposals on this. Basically, it's uh, similar to the challenges I mentioned, uh, in line with the challenge I mentioned. So first is uh, to improve the learning ability of the Tibet student. Of course, policy is important, but the Tibet institution can have a lot of things to do. Uh, for example, the further promotion of the hands-on project or problem-based learning. I know they are already doing, but uh, uh, I think it is imp uh, more important to give up, uh, op it is important to give a more opportunity for self-learning through the trial and errors because I still need to run the situation in Malaysia more, but in general, Tibet students tend to have a limited opportunity for trial and errors, um, partially related to the like many equipment expensive. And then I used to work in Tibet institutions, and I fully understand that our instructors are afraid 
to let the student to touch on the machines because they're afraid to, that the student will damage it. But uh, still, uh, they need a chance for trial and, and errors. That's uh, very important. So that's why like uh, uh, some hands-on project could be very important. That is not only for higher education students, but also important for Tibet students. And then uh, another thing is uh, I really recommend to promote a student interest in uh, uh, certain theoretical knowledge. Practical knowledge is, uh, skills are very important too. But uh, yeah, uh, the curiosity on uh, theoretical knowledge is also very important. Uh, sorry, um, Datuk, you, you think uh, I should shorten my comment? <laughs> No, not at all, not at all, because... Okay, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah, sorry. Now we have yeah. uh, two speakers instead of three, yeah? Yeah, okay, so carry okay. Plenty of time. Sure, sure, thank you very much. Because um, uh, maybe Ms. Uh, Sasha can give a more detail, but uh, for example, when uh, I used to work in Tibet institutions, our students know how to operate uh, like a computer, uh, uh, CNC machines or uh, machine too but they don't know why like a one metal can cut another metal. So they need to be curious why they can do that. And then how, uh, what's the best matching between the cutting tools and the material and so on. So I don't say like a uh, Tibet student have a uh, same knowledge, uh, same level of the theoretical knowledge as a higher education student, but still they still need a uh, uh, certain theoretical knowledge. So, and then another point is about the equality and diversity. So again, like uh, pr promoting a flexible program for the people in a vulnerable group is very important. Uh, at the ILO, we often recommend Tibet institution to work on a civil society organizations or community-based organization like uh, uh, NGO and so on, because they often have a better outreach. So that could be the one thing. And then uh, as our project for Skills for Prosperity Malaysia, uh, we try to do uh, this in a sub Kedar. So hopefully we can report some results soon. So finally, sorry, uh, about uh, uh, how to shape the public perception, that's quite uh, <laughs> difficult. And then the challenges in the many countries, not only in Malaysia, including Japan, I, I think in the many developed countries too. So um, I just uh, want to go for a, a little uh, simple concept. I think a Tibet students tend to be a little bit conservative and then tend to limit their potentials, uh, partially by themselves, but uh, by their parents and then by the instructor too. Then I borrow the word from the famous uh, founder of the Apple, Steve Jobs. I really like his word. He said, like, stay hungry and stay foolish. And then that's the word he's keeping for himself. And then that's the word I want to keep for myself. So I think it's really important to use, to be curious about new skills and technology. Often they think that uh, people with a uh, high level of the knowledge, but no, even students can utilize those new skills and then there are a lot of the space uh, they can utilize those knowledge and skills. And then also, I think uh, um, uh, many Tibet students uh, tend to have a limited knowledge about the upskilling and learning opportunity. So it is very important to increase awareness of the upskilling and learning opportunities. Uh, actually, the government are uh, doing a lot, and then uh, probably like a Tibet institutions, like a Miss Sasha's institutions, should be doing a lot. But simply, many students uh, or youth have a limited knowledge, so the information is very important. So, reduce information gap is important. And then, uh, uh, as the ILO in Malaysia, what we try to do is uh, we are currently working with the Economic Planning Unit and then Department of Statistics Malaysia and then Talent Corp. About uh, their, uh, we provide a technical assistance for the labor market information analytics platform initiative. So, by uh, through our technical assistance, I hope we can reduce the uh, information gap about uh, learning and the upskilling opportunity for youth. Um, sorry, I hope uh, I covered uh, these uh, three big questions, but <laughs> please tell me if I miss anything. Thank you very much, Datuk. Thank you, Dr. Mori. Uh, you've given us a very good perspective. I think, you know, your experience in different countries. Uh, 
Um, so the perspective you've given us uh, is extremely valuable. I mean, you emphasize quite a lot on automation and uh, IoT and um, you know, use use of technologies and current current trades. Uh, yes, that that's very important. So that a lot of menial tasks uh, don't have to be done. Um, you know, and it will automatically enhance the image and profile of people working together with technology. Yes, and and very interesting. You mentioned gender equality. I mean, that's that's uh, that's something I have not realized myself. And maybe Sasha can uh, tell us a bit more about you know how this plays out in our local environment. Um, institutionally, you've also said um, uh, enhance hands-on experience. Yeah. I think that's an extremely valid point. Uh, how we can work with the industry and get people experienced while they are studying, uh, getting them to actually do the real job, yeah, and uh, so forth. Um, shaping public perception—that's always a huge challenge. But I think that there are. Uh, it's a pity Dr. Schroeder is not here, but we were. I was hoping that we can tap on him to see how they have actually uh, glorified. Uh, event in Germany, uh, very much sought after. People want to do it. Uh, they they actually seek places in institutions uh, to be admitted uh, because there is a lot of competition for that uh, type of skills. You know that's that's a, uh, something to think about as to how uh, certain countries have actually achieved that. Um, and increasing upskilling opportunities, I think definitely. Uh, right now in Malaysia, just like um, uh, what Sasha has said earlier, uh, the progression from TVET uh, to the academic uh, uh, framework pathway, uh, that's actually helping quite a lot because people can see where they stand uh, yeah, in relation to uh, their fellow uh, you know, graduates from universities. So um, Sasha, there's plenty of time. You don't have to rush. Uh, we are running about 20 minutes ahead of time at the moment, uh, uh, 17 minutes to be precise. So don't worry. And we'd like to see what your perspective is, again, uh, on the policy side, um, especially on the local front, and also from the institutional side, which I think you'll be able to give us a very good perspective. And Dr. Mori also said that you'll be able to give us a good perspective because you're running such an institution with more than a 1,000 trainees. Yeah, as I uh, learned, and also how do we overcome the um, public perception? I mean, there's very few people uh, trying to get into it, um, and the country has been struggling. Literally, have been literally spoon feeding, isn't it? Uh, trying to create all kinds of funds, yeah, uh, paying people allowances, and still they don't want to do it. So, uh, but Dr. Mori did throw some light as to why that's happening. But maybe we can also see your perspective. On the local front. Okay, Sasha, over to you now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bramjit. Um, Dr. Mori, thank you very much for your insight. You are quite a hard act to follow, I must admit. Um, okay, so thank you for the opportunity to just kind of give my insight on how we can address the challenges of our, our TVET environment in Malaysia. Now, from a policy perspective, um, just personally from my experience last year, I worked as the National Apprenticeship Expert under the British Council, and we did a five nation study to compare the Malaysian landscape of apprenticeship systems. However, that overlapped into, of course, we had to dig deeper and look at the TVET systems of our country. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the streamlining of MQ and JPK because uh, if I started with that, I don't think I'll end and the 17 minutes head start that Dr. Farangit has, I think would be over very quickly. <laughs> so I'm going to keep it quite simple and sweet for um, streamlining. MQ and JPK have already done a great job, like I mentioned earlier, to kind of get everything on the same pathway. Second thing that I think um, policymakers need to be a little bit more aware of in our landscape is funding. Now, every student in Malaysia, TVET is normally, and I say this not with um, the future in mind, but with the past decade from our experience, TVET has generally been um, taken up by students from not just the T20s, but 
a bigger proportion of our students come from B40 environments and M M40 environments. Now, these are students who are going to need some sort of funding assistance. Now, the government has set up a fund called PTPK, Perbadanan Tabung Pembangunan Kemahiran, which in Malaysia, everybody knows this, the word PTPTN. When you say PTPK, they have no idea what that acronym stands for. Now, funding is something that these students need for them to be able to move forward. Just going back into the psyche of a student who normally goes into a TVET um, diploma. These are students who already come from a little bit of hardship in their backgrounds. They come from situations which are not so comfortable for them to attend tuition classes, for them to attend extra learning um, assistance during their high school education, which is why they've already come with grades which may not be so suitable for them to immediately jump into higher academic higher education. Now, I'm not saying that TVET is only meant for students who did bad in, in exams. In our experience, we've got students with straight A's, we've got students with seven A's, five A's, three passes, all fail. Everybody seems to want to get into TVET when they learn what TVET is about. However, funding seems to be a very, very big issue for them to pursue this dream, for them to pursue this further education. So I think funding is something that needs to be not just looked at as a singular project, which means 2022, hey, let's pump a big budget into TVET. No, it needs to be put into the Malaysian roadmap, education roadmap consistently. It's always a buzzword. TVET is always a buzzword in our blueprints. However, it needs to be looked at as not just a happy thing to talk about when times are good, but it needs to be, this is a real catalyst to how we can change our, um, our economic um, ways of Malaysia. Now, the third thing is, of course, branding and awareness. In Malaysia, unfortunately, and I think this is quite a sad truth to be told, TVET is looked at like the stepchild of education. If you can't become you know, the scholar child in the family, it's okay, go into TVET. Now that branding and perception needs to change. It needs to become something where it's not about whether your grades were high or low. It's about the ability or your interest to study as a hands-on hands -on practical learner. That's actually what TVET is. It's about the people who learn differently compared to the students who like to sit in university and read books and write theory papers. Hands on are the kids who were, you know, being told off in class because they can't sit, sit st still. They are the students who want to use their hands to actually be doing work. That's actually the perception that needs to change. It needs to become, you go into TVET because you are a hands on practical learner and the pathways will allow you to get the same master's degree, the same PhDs as the academic learner. And of course, the career pathways. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The career pathways for a TVET student, most of the time, something that we have seen. Now, TTC, we run MQA, which is academic pathways, and we also run TVET. Now, because of the hands-on practical um, basis of what TVET is, our students tend to go into the job market, and they are very highly sought after. We've got 250 industry partners that wait for our graduation every year because they know these students have already done things using their hands. And so they go in with practical skills where they, like Dr. Maurice said something quite funny just now, and I was laughing because this is something our industry partners tell us all the time. I have a $2 million CNC machine in my company. I am not going to let a fresh graduate touch that machine because although I have insurance, I'm not going to let a fresh grad touch that machine because he's never touched a machine a day in his life. Where else our TVET students, we have CNC machines in our practical centers. They need to be doing all of that before they step out into the job market. So there's a very, very different um, perception change that needs to be made here, where TVET actually is not just the second choice, but actually a different choice, a highly successful different choice for people who want to go into an education that allows you to be hands-on and practical. Now, something else that I wanted to talk about was the branding of TVET. Now, Dr. Mori keeps talking about gender bias. Absolutely. As somebody who is female, and I will not disclose my age in this platform, however, I am not the actual uh, profile of somebody you see in TVET. Now, this is something that I have faced time and again, and my students, my female students, face this time and again. We run precision engineering, logistics, and retail. Whenever I have a female student who goes to an employer, they immediately assume that this is a student who came from a retail 
management diploma. However, this is a female student that has gone through three years of precision engineering. Now, this is a gender bias that needs to be changed in our Malaysian mindset. And this is something that not just policymakers, but of course, TVET implementers like ourselves need to change our own mindsets that TVET is not just for boys. It is no longer just machining. It is no longer just welding. Um, it's no longer just, you know, manufacturing. TVET encompasses logistics, retail management, fashion, culinary, all of these really interesting jobs that a lot of other countries have already um, pursued. They have made these jobs, quote unquote, sexy for people to go into the TVET environment. You're looking at Gordon Ramsay, Jamie Oliver, and all of these, you know, um, fashionistas who all have actually come from a TVET hands-on background and have made very big success stories of themselves. Those are the people we should be branding to make sure TVET is looked at as a potential pathway for success. And uh, finally, of course, how does TVET adapt? How do our policymakers adapt to the current environment? We are struggling with COVID-19. We've been sitting at home since 2020. How does education and policymakers in education adapt to ensuring TVET isn't left behind? Because I go on and on about hands-on, but what do you do with education when you actually can't be there to touch and feel? How do you do hands-on education then? Now, this is where I think policymakers need to step in and step in quickly. We have had a lot of progress in Ministry of Education and also in Ministry of Human Resource to be able to assist um, implementers of TVET education to see how we can quickly automate and digitalize our machining um, education, for example. How can we start doing online simulations? How can we digitalize all of our programs so that our assessments can then still be of the same quality, of the same quality, but still allow the student to proceed with their education? It shouldn't be such that because someone has chosen TVET, and chosen this pathway, they then become, they will have to wait because we haven't taken the steps forward to adapt to our current environment where education cannot be run face to face at the moment. So I think that's something that maybe the government can look into a little bit more and move faster because we thought we would be locked down for three months and then it became six months. And two years later, we are still waiting to go back. So we don't know how long this is going to move forward. So that is um, just some of my input from the policy side of things. Um, Dr. Pra uh, Dr. Paramjit, is there something that maybe you want to add on before I go into institution? Uh, no, not really, but I think you, you've covered a, a fairly wide area. But the Five Nations study is very important, yeah? And I think um, you could actually draw out and, um, some, some good practices and perhaps influence uh, government policies here. And I assume that you are involved. You mentioned that uh, you know there were presentations made to Human Resource and Education Ministry here. So I think that would be very useful. But uh, I agree with you know everything that you have said. And that's you know I'm not in the debate area, but I keep hearing uh, uh, very similar points that you have brought up uh, that our policymakers. Uh, need to, um, um, you know, effect certain changes, but also the perception issues. The perception issue is a big issue. Um, for example, you mentioned precision engineering. Uh, the assumption will be that it is a male who would have done it, yeah? Uh, employers wouldn't expect a, a female with a precision engineering qualification. Um, but I was also taken up by what you just said. Uh, about um, you know people not allowing uh, you know newly qualified newly new graduates uh, to touch uh, pretty sensitive expensive expensive fields yeah so uh, very interesting points Asha and uh, and I'm sure you know we are getting something very invaluable from from you because you are right there in the field producing graduates and you can see this problem likely occurring right in front of you. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah. Um, okay, you can tell us how how you've been doing it institutionally. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for those kind yeah. words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, institution wise. Now, I also TTC also sits on the exco um, of TVET private TVET providers in Malaysia. 
we have um, an organization called FEMAC, and FEMAC has over 200 and sorry, 600 something private uh, TVET providers. Now, as an institution, we always focus on ensuring our syllabus has to be industry standard and industry linked. Now, Dr. Mori spoke a little bit about that because he comes himself from the private sector, and I and I I think that experience is really invaluable. A lot of educationists, and um, I say this with ourselves included, we seem to forget how quickly industry changes. And with IR 4.0, the industry is going to change again. Now, something that Dr. Mori said, which I really um, I really took on board, is that there seems to be an actual fear of the word. IR 4.0, especially in Malaysia, people are very afraid of it. They don't know what it is, so they immediately become very afraid. But actually, if we removed some of those questions and some of those, um, it's shrouded in some sort of, you know, like a magical haze. But actually what it is, it's, it's actually taking those skills that human people are doing right now and ensuring that it can be automated and digitalized, getting machines to do things that normally human beings were doing. And that's actually where Tibet comes into play. Our institutions need to look at all of the processes that we are actually teaching our students. We shouldn't be teaching them things that robots can take. There is a, there's a saying, I think, from, from way back when, when it says, you know, the robots are going to take over our jobs. Well, that's true. And that's what we need. We need the robots to take over our jobs so that human brains can be used for elevated processes. Now, that is the job of TVET institutions and policymakers, but as TVET institutions, we need to make sure that we are linking with industry to see what they actually need. And the education industry is already going through a revolution. Brick and mortar, having huge campuses and things like that doesn't seem to be the way forward. People have already learned that they can actually do education from sitting at home in their pajamas. So, how are we in brick and mortar education need to ensure that we are teaching them the relevant things for today's needs? You know, building programs that are relevant today, gone are the days in, in my and your environments where as a child comes out and says, I want to be a doctor, lawyer, or an engineer. You know, I've got kids myself, they come to me and they say, I want to be a coding analyst, or I want to be, I don't know, a Facebook digital specialist. And I have no idea what these things mean. So we need to be building programs that are relevant to those sectors and to the sectors that are growing. They are growth industries, not just physical hands on things that we know, but the things that are moving our economies forward. Now, in Malaysia, I do admit we are a little bit slow to the uptake. Um, I wish Dr. Schroeder was here to give us his insights as well with how Germany does it. Japan, I know, has done some amazing work in Tibet. They are actually one of um, very, very powerful with regards to, to countries in this nation, Tibet. With regards to institutions, we need to make sure that the syllabus that we're teaching is relevant today. We also need to ensure that the quality standards of what we deliver don't slip during a time like this, because we owe it to our students. We owe it to them to ensure that we have auto automated and digitalized enough to ensure that what they are paying us for, what the government is paying us for, is still delivered at the same rate as if they were with us face to face. Moving on, I would just like to touch a little bit about public perception, especially students. Now, of course, this is my favorite topic because these are students that I see every single day. Um, touch and feel of students is, is something that we're very passionate about. TTC was formed because we realized there was a gap in the market where our young Malaysians were being let go without any opportunities if they failed SPM or if they did three credits or if someone did well in SPM, but just decided, you know what, I don't want to go to lectures every day, sit down and just listen to somebody talking to me. So that's why TTC was born. And over the last 18 years, we've managed to build programs that have made our students successful. Public perception, um, students' perception, the answer to any successful education pathway, whether TVET or um, MQA, is actually fairly simple. It's always about the recognition of the course, the certificate that they come out with needs to be recognized. It's about funding. If they can't afford to pay for it out of their own pocket, somebody needs to help them. 
Now, these are 17, 18, 19 year olds who have their entire future ahead of them. Futures that help shape our economy, our country's economy. They need assistance right now so that they can give back to our economy moving forward. And finally, it's about jobs, it's about careers. They need to be able to have education that guarantees them careers in high demand industries. Now, the reason why TTC, we have kept our cost um, offerings quite small, precision engineering, logistics and retail, is because you cannot go out with these diplomas and say you cannot find a job. These are some of the biggest industries in our country. And our 250 um, industry partners are testament to that. They wait for our graduations so that they can snatch up these graduates every single year. It's actually just that simple. Recognition, funding, and the success of their job and career. Students with TVET education, finding jobs is actually really easy because employers know they come with hands-on experience. Now, employers actually really, really um, like them. Now, we have looked at policy, policy and um, um, policy and different types of things have been developed by the government, right from SLDN, which is Malaysia's answer to apprenticeship. Um, they've also tried to do talent corp apprenticeships. Different types of products have been brought out, but because of perception of TVET, because of perception of people don't even know what apprenticeship parantisan means, these great systems and these great answers and solutions are not being taken up by the general public because people don't know what it is. So how do we change that? How do we actually change that? Now, the first thing I would like to say is when you're selling to somebody who is 18 years old, and the, the difference between, I think, something that, that a lot of um, our policymakers don't understand today is the decision maker in this process, last time during my generation, my parents, Sorry, I believe I was on mute. Yeah. My apologies. My apologies. I think my internet has dropped out. Let me just um, continue from where I was saying just now. The, um, the marketing of TVET to students. I was saying just now that these students have had handphones since they were in high school. The decision makers of what they're going to study is no longer the parents. It's actually the student. Now, our advertising of how we advertise TVET, how we change public perception needs to be catered to these students. They need to be looking at advertising on Instagram. They need to be looking at advertising on Facebook. They need to be looking at advertising on TikTok. I know it sounds so counterintuitive for a product as important as higher education. But this is the way we change the market's perception. It needs to go down to the actual consumer's needs and making sure that they understand that TVET can change their futures. And it is a relevant, demand-driven, and a successful pathway for them to enter after their high school education. So I think that's, um, that's pretty much all I have to say on that topic. Uh, I hope my little... Uh, internet dropout didn't um, disrupt my information too much. Dr. Uh, Dr. Baram, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Sasha. That was really good and comprehensive. Um, just looking at how you do your advertising, uh, this is great. Uh, I, I don't think anyone can see it, but this is an employer saying, why hire TTC apprentices? apprentices? Yeah. And he's saying you get new full-time Malaysian employees working with you for a minimum of two years, learning skills you need for your company, get double next deductions. That's that's amazing. So you you have uh, uh, an advertising strategy to to uh, to draw in uh, students for your courses. That's uh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, you, you covered a lot, but can I can I just ask you? Did you say under FEMAC there are six hundred institutions? Yes, there's uh, over six hundred institutions that are private TVET providers. Right. Okay, that's that's a lot, huh? Uh, oh yes, yeah, there are many yeah. of us. And uh, uh, would you say that you are in the top quartile in terms of numbers? I mean, they many of them would be much smaller than your institution. Is that? 
That is that is true. That is true. Um, and it's an unfortunate fact, in fact, because I think the work that we're doing is actually quite crucial and important. So okay. the more the industry grows, the better for our Malaysians. Yeah, so I, I can't multiply 600 by 1000. Yeah, that will not be the right number. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think you, you have outlined quite a number of things. The fear of IR 4.0, it looks like a very uh, um, daunting uh you know um, um future technology that's coming down on us yeah a lot of people may not understand that but i, I suppose the schools are not uh, creating the familiarization of mm -hmm. what IR for really means uh, linking with industries I, I was really fascinated by what you said here because it, it is a concept that i myself strongly believe in um linking with industry and what they really need uh and also focusing on the growth industries of where the growth might be, um, and also not uh, letting quality drop during times like this when uh, they are not on campus. Um, this this is exactly what I believe in. Uh, you you can't be producing any graduate if you're not working together with industry. Exactly. Yeah? Uh, exactly. And and you are creating an unemployment pool. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah. So. I mean, we, I go one step further and I often tell my colleagues that our clients in our university are not the students, they are actually industry itself, both yep. of our clients. So, yep. because we, we are set up to, to uh, provide them with the pool of uh, talent that they need, so how can students really become the clients? So exactly. many, many universities cannot, universities or colleges or institutions, they, they don't relate things like that. Um, so that's what you're here for. You're, you're producing talent. So define your client properly and serve your client. Yeah. Uh, very simple, isn't it? Yeah. And these Absolutely. simple things are lost. Yeah. And uh, in terms of recognition of courses, yes, you said many things, but I think, um, you know, success of the job, uh, that's what we need to promote so that people can see the result of. Uh, what uh, they they can be if they actually follow the TVET path, yeah. Um, exactly. That's good. Recognition of courses. So a lot of publicity is required. And uh, uh, I want to go back to Dr. Murray. Um, Dr. Murray, um, you mentioned the global framework earlier, and you also said that uh, you can share this. Uh, that will really be interesting. But uh, the next question actually relates very closely to uh, the global framework. Um, you know, TVET has always been perceived to be uh, separate and different from higher education. Yeah, it's, it's always seen to be different. Uh, in, in Malaysia, we have brought it closer together by coming up with a framework uh, that leads TVET uh, graduates into the academic area. Um, now, the question to you is, how can we bridge these two terrains of tertiary education to the level that the perception that they are different? How, how do we bring them together? How do we harmonize it? Um, and maybe the answer lies in what you mentioned about the framework. Uh, global framework, I would assume that this is recognition given by a number of a cluster of countries, um, not just insular to any one country yeah so can you give us a little bit of an overview on that how we can harmonize the two sectors tvet and higher education okay yeah, thank you very much, Tatuk. It's probably my answer will be a little overlap with uh, Ms. Sasha's answer. But the uh, global framework is a global framework for core skills. Uh, because, uh, as I said, like uh, core skills, like problem solving skills or uh, critical thinking skills, often like uh, people, like employer, think that's the skills require, required for the engineers graduated from university. But uh, what I want to emphasize is uh, no. Uh, it's also important for the Tibet students. They also need to solve the problem. And then, they, for example, they may be a technician or skilled operators when uh, they, uh, you know, get a job. But they need to negotiate with the engineers or managers. For this, they need uh, those core skills. So again, like uh, that core skills will help uh, Tibet graduate to have uh, career progressions. Uh, that's why that these skills are important. So. 
in the end, like, I think it is really important to ensure the career progression of the Tibet graduate and then eliminate that permanent gap between the Tibet and the higher education graduate. Um, to be honest, maybe the entry point can be different. Like uh, I used to work for a elect consumer electronics uh, manufacturing company, and then a university graduate and then a Tibet graduate join a different level. That's probably no choice. However, if uh, in a continuous career, always this job stay, Permanently, that's going to be a problem, and then nobody wants to join the Tibet. So, like, uh, the, maybe taking time, the career should like a converge, or a Tibet student should have a chance to even like uh, overpass university graduate, depending on skills. Um, that's very important. Uh, so, for so for example, like uh, uh, when I was working in the private sector, I have a one uh, graduate, uh, one friend who graduated the technical college. And then uh, he joined as a service engineer, a bit lower gra grade than a uh, university graduate who joined the company at the same years. But uh, later, uh, he studied uh, like uh, programming of the microcontroller by, them, by himself. And then he developed his skills. And then later, like uh, he almost uh, hit a grade and salary catch up a university graduate. And then like uh, he even become a programmer with a smartphone. And then now he's a project manager. So nobody, you know, distinguish him or differentiate him from either he's a university graduate or higher education graduate because of his skills. Um, of course, it depends on uh, his own effort. I admire it. But another thing is that he had the opportunity to study in a company or outside of the company. So that's why like uh, giving the opportunity or the lifelong learning or continuous learning is very important. So, so that's uh, one issue. Uh, another thing is uh, uh, how to, uh, but still I think it's important to give uh, opportunity for Tibet students to transfer to higher education. Uh, we shouldn't eliminate uh, that path, uh, as Mr. Sasha said. So like, uh, um, I got a PhD from Cardiff University in the UK. My supervisor was great, but actually he used to be a welding uh, technician. <laughs> yeah, And then of course he, he got a PhD in the end, but uh, somehow like, he proud that he used to work in an automotive factory and uh, he did a uh, welding. So that uh, sort of path should be important. And then uh, as uh, Ms. Sasha explained, I, I understand there's a path in Malaysia, but the question is uh, how effective or uh, of that passes. Often, uh, to be honest, in Japan, the pass is not that effective. And then um, the country I used to work before Malaysia is Vietnam, there was a pass, but uh, uh, there was not much monitoring was done for the effectiveness of this pass. So I still need to learn a bit more about the situation in Malaysia, but I think it is really important to monitor how effective is a transfer pass between Tibet and higher education. Otherwise, like uh, as Ms. Sasha said, now the young people know many things. Huh? They have a lot of information. So if uh, that pass doesn't work, they already know. So they don't want to join Tibet. Then finally, I think uh, this, uh, maybe I'm repeating the point uh, Ms. Sasha mentioned, is uh, it is really important to improve both economic and then social status of the Tibet students. Uh, not only one of that, but both. So uh, one thing is about the wage. Um, when I work at, in the industry, like I tend to say like, oh, money is not oh, everything, like uh, why people care about the wage, but uh, wage is important. <laughs> so it is very important to promote a skill-based wage in partnership with industry. I know it's not impo uh, very. I know it's quite difficult because uh, wage is very sensitive for industry, and then uh, I'm not uh, pro uh, advocating something like compuls compulsory, but uh, still like uh, promoting like uh, the wage system based on skills is very important. Uh, not only based on education attainment. Education attainment is important, but uh, we also need to balance the uh, like uh, value of the skills. And then uh, another thing is the social status. Um, wage is important, but also social recognition is very important, as Ms. Sasha said. For this, um, 
I myself have been struggling how to do this. Uh, maybe better promotion uh, is always important. Like uh, utilizing uh, current technology is fascinating, like uh, TikTok, like Facebook. That's something I myself need to learn, to be honest. So, but uh, also I think uh, it is important to find out the role models because uh, if you know somebody who is successful, uh, I think uh, people will believe like uh, Tibet is a good option. Like uh, um, some of my friends who graduated the Tibet, uh, they have a skills, but also they had a decent wage and then salary. So like uh, he, his hobby is like uh, driving uh, uh, very high-end motorcycles. So it means that he has, uh, you know, <laughs> a way to earn, you know, just uh, feed into his uh, hobby, but also his social status. Many people respect him too. So also, like, uh, my colleagues in Malaysia told me, like, uh, for example, there's a people who did uh, uh, welding for the large pipe under the sea. They also need the skills, and they often they train by the Tibet institutions, and they're also like a building maintenance. Uh, nowadays, like uh, we think about the sustainability, so not only uh, building the you know building, but also after that, like how to make building uh, more efficient or uh, more sustainable. That's very important. So those people are often from Tibet past, so we still need, uh, we really. I uh, need to recognize the value of the, these skilled people, often from uh, Tibet past. So yeah, that's my immediate answer, Datuk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mori. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood your global framework, but I understand now it's for the core competencies. Yeah, but nevertheless, very important. Um, and also ensuring career progression. Um, you talked about convergence. Um, that, that would be an interesting model. And I think Sasha might be able to take us a little bit further uh, by uh, actually illustrating what our pathway right now is, the new pathway that's appeared uh, from the PWET screen uh, right onto the MQA accredited screen. Yeah, so maybe Sasha can, uh, can help us with that. Um, but thank you, Dr. Mori, for also expounding on the social and economic status elements, uh, very important. Um, I mean, a lot of promotion needs to be done, I agree, and using role models, yes. But I would also like to add, um, a lot of guidance is actually given in schools. So even school counselors must be trained to understand, um, yeah, so that they actually put uh, uh, students on the right path. Um, because a lot of streaming can be done there uh, as well, like they do in Singapore actually quite a bit. Um, and also, I suppose parents, uh, parents will still be, a lot of parents from the old school will still be helping with the traditional yeah. professions like, uh, you know, you must be a doctor and you must be, you know, an engineer or an accountant mm -hmm. without understanding it, um, you know, but I, I would have loved to do event before I did anything else because uh, without going to any college or school, I, I used to dirty my hands, uh, dirty my fingers by doing all kinds of things that you guys will be doing in event colleges. But uh, I, I didn't do it in a formal system, but I enjoyed doing it on my own when I was younger. So, Sasha, over to you and uh, let us see your perspective of uh, how this convergence can happen in Malaysia and how we can overcome uh, the major perception issues so that uh, this will become uh, a career of choice, yeah, uh, following the TVET group. Thank you, Sasha, and please, over to you. Sure, thank you, Dato. Um, I'm going to keep this quite simple and short because I think we, we have covered many areas in this discussion. The convergence, ne the convergence needs to happen between MQA and JPK. Um, there is many, many industries involved in TVET in Malaysia. The landscape of uh, Malaysian TVET system is handled currently by seven different ministries. Now, higher education is one of them, and there are many other ministries that are involved in the delivery of TVET. Now, getting everybody to sit together and streamline has been something that MOHE and also um, 
the Human Resource Ministry has been done, doing over the last few years. They have come up with a system called COPTA. Um, they also have a few more systems in the pipeline where they have taken TVET systems and matched it against academic systems and ensured that a student coming out with a diploma Kemahiran in Malaysia, which um, is actually a Malaysian skills diploma, can be recognized the same as a student coming out with an NQA diploma which means the starting point for these two students will become the same. So like Dr. Mori was saying just now, he gave an example where um, a, a person joins an industry new and because he comes from a TVET um, environment, he gets started at a different level compared to an academic graduate with a diploma or a degree. Now this guy will have to, the TVET graduate will have to work maybe many more years be before he can be given the same opportunities as the academic person and the same um, wage that can be offered to the academic person. Now, this shouldn't happen. This actually just shouldn't happen. It needs to be streamlined so that both people start at the same starting point. And this is something that our government has already started making good progress towards. So I think the, the bridging of these two is making sure that everybody has the same starting point and everybody can finish at the same point as well. The wage, um, the income gap is not so evident if you come from TVET or you come from MQA. So I think that's actually all I can I have to say after you know that long information that I gave just now. So I think in Malaysia we are making good strides towards streamlining. I just hope that it's a little bit faster so that more students can enjoy the benefits of this this streamlining process. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Um, you mentioned something fascinating. Um, you say MQA and JPK must come together, yeah, uh, to make things better. But you also mentioned that TVET is uh, covered by a number of ministries, yeah. Uh, that must be challenging. Uh, you want to say something about how it should be and, and what the challenges right now are and how it should be rationalized? Um, to be very honest, uh, Dr. Param, it is a, a challenging landscape. It's a challenging landscape because TVET is not just looked at as an academic solution. It is also looked at as a manpower solution. So there are different ministries who have come in, Ministry of Agriculture. So they have TVET and um, skills training programs in, in the agricultural ministry, for example. They also have Jabatan Tenaga Manusia, which is um, the Department for um, Human Resources. For, for skilled manpower. So that's an entire different agency by, by themselves. So TVET is actually right now, because of the fact that it's viewed as a skilled manpower solution and not just an academic solution, it has been littered across many different agencies giving the same solutions. Now what JPK has done, what MQA is trying to do right now is they're trying to collate everybody and put them all under one umbrella so that the quality standards and the accreditation and the certification standards can all be matched so that a student coming out with a JTM certificate is not looked at differently from a student with a JPK certificate and an MQA certificate. Everybody just needs to get on board. TVET is an academic solution for Malaysians and it needs to come under the Ministry of Education, if possible. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha, for that explanation. I think I think so. We're making good stride here. I think that's what we were saying earlier. Uh, that's very good. So they all come under the code of practice for event program accreditation. That's that's what you were referring to earlier. Copta, is it. it? Yes, Copta. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, look. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mori and Sasha, um, for for your. For your presentations, um, they, they have been very enlightening. And Dr. Mori, you have brought in uh, quite a few examples from uh, across uh, different countries. Um, I mean, based on your experience, and Sasha, you have given us a very local perspective, and I think very appropriate. But the bottom line is, I think we all agree that we need to enhance the status of EWET uh, so that we can get the right people into it, and we can actually feed it into the talent pool required by. Uh, the nation in economic development. Um, we also have a number of questions that have been put forward. Uh, can I I'll just scroll and see uh, what we have here. All right, we've had the very first question from Kiran Raj, 
Uh, how does DWAT providers ensure industry is involved uh, in the education price of education space. education space, I suppose, to ensure quality and jobs opportunities for students? So I think this relates more to um, how, how how you get how you how you get industry involved, and I think Sasha, maybe you can take on this question and tell us how you do it uh, in your institution. Yes, happy happy to take this. Um, so the way we deal with our partners is, first of all, we only run courses that are very demand driven. So a lot of times, and this is a very fortunate position to be in, industry partners reach out to us because we're running such niche um, programs and in the TVET market. Industry partners, DHL, DB Schenker, uh, we've got Panasonic for Engineering, we've got uh, Wing Tai, who is basically Dorothy Perkins, H&M and all. They reach out to us because we are uh, one of the few providers that do TVET in these areas. Now, the way they deal with us is they get involved from day one of our students' education. They deal with our curriculum development. They deal with ensuring our students are learning the correct syllabus for what is needed in the job markets today. They even go um, far enough to send their people over. Um, last time when we weren't locked down, they would send their manpower to come and give our students insights into what the industry is like. They allow our students to go over to their companies to see what the actual working environment is like. And at the end of it all, at the end of their two and a half years, before their graduation, we have campus interviews where these industry partners come in and already do um, campus interviews with our students. So employment is not really that big a problem for our students because of how engaged the industry partners are. So I think this is just one model. It's a model that works for us. And I think maybe this is something that um, TVET does well because of how engaged we are with industry. Yeah, thank you for that, Sasha. I mean, you know, that's exactly even what we do at the university level. Uh, I, I believe if you don't work with industry closely, then uh, you won't be producing the type of people that industry really wants. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question is. In Malaysia, TVET is under the purview of several ministries. How does this structurally um, and policy and institutional monitoring affect or impact the quality of teaching and learning? I think this has already been answered uh, inherently. Um, although it's in different ministries, it's now being harmonized, uh, like what you said, um, through the code of practice for TVET program accreditation. So quality will be monitored across the board, and it doesn't matter from which ministry. And there'll also be harmonizing of levels uh, and pathways to the academic side. Yeah. So uh, we'll skip that. Uh, how do we develop skills demand in our economy? Any specific recommendations, um, Dr. Mori? You want to take this up? Uh, how do yes. We develop uh, that, okay. Sure. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it's maybe I can just uh, mention a little bit of conceptual issues. But uh, of course, uh, the skills uh, policy is like a TBET policy, skills policy, but demand side policies, industrial policies. So I know like uh, Malaysia has a good policy for both sides. The question is how these policies are aligned together. So like uh, uh, many master plans are really aligned with the sector skills policy or even there is a sector skills policy. So just the checking the alignment to be very important. And then another issue is uh, industrial policy makers and the skills policy makers have a different perceptions, ideas sometimes. So it's really important the interaction uh, between uh, these two policy makers so when uh, industrial policy is made, uh, the, I recommend a certain participation of the skills policy maker. Sometimes like, they make a different policies and it's not aligned perfectly or uh, sufficiently. No need to be perfect, sorry. Yeah, so that's something it is very important to check. Uh, another thing is that if we just try to align the both skills demand and supply policy for all sector, it's impossible. So that's why at the ILO, we uh, recommend a sectoral approach. So better to focus on the sector. So like a sectoral industrial policy and then a sectoral skills policy, how they align. That's uh, one thing we can do. And then uh, finally, 
Uh, I said the perception of the industrial policy maker and skills policy maker are sometimes different because uh, for the what the policy maker who uh, develop industries to help the employers, then the employer's view is not always the same as the educator's view. So, um, so like uh, sometimes like uh, industrial policy tend to focus on a little bit, uh, how to say, narrow range of the policy. For example, uh, when I talk with uh, many employers, they attention really go to the very specific skills needs. But uh, for the long-term skills development for the workers, they need a bit broader skills. That's why I said the core skills are important. So that's why like uh, input from the skills perspective, I mean the input of the skills policy maker to industrial policy maker is very important. So one of the examples is Maybe you know like uh, uh, industry transformation maps uh, made by the Singapore, that's uh, one trial. I wouldn't say it's uh, perfect, but uh, it's an interesting trial. So maybe in Malaysia, again, I know like there are a lot of the good policy, uh, they are comprehensive, but uh, it's uh, worthwhile looking at the alignment uh, of the sectoral policy at both skills and demand side. Yeah. Thank you very much, Datuk. Thank you, Dr. Mori. Um... You know, that was really fascinating. I mean, you've thrown a lot of light on this, uh, more than I expected. Um, in Malaysia, we also try to harmonize between our industrial master plans and our periodical uh, national development plans. And, and uh, it'll be interesting to also see what Singapore has come up with in terms of the industry uh, transformation map here. Yeah? Uh, so, yeah, this has to be done at the federal national levels, yeah? And, uh, and we take guidance from it. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, the next question is, how can higher education and TVAT bridge further beyond just pathway and recognition? Uh, I think in, in some ways we've really answered this question. There's convergence, yeah, and, uh, and uh, equal opportunities as though you are in the academic pathway as much as, you know, with, from TVAT to PhDs, and Dr. Mori also mentioned his tutor uh, was, uh, a TVET uh, person um, moving up right up to PhD, isn't it? So uh, that, that's, uh, that's the way it can be done. Uh, Australia does well in TVET because of their policy in allowing only certified skills based workers to operate. Uh, can such a policy be a catalyst in Malaysia uh, too? Uh, Sasha, can you take that on? Uh, this is a challenge, and I think um, one of you had mentioned cheap labor earlier. Uh, yeah, uh, causing a, a causing a, a disruption to our uh, towards a journey towards having certified people in the in in uh, in industry. Maybe you can throw some light on this. Sure. Um, absolutely. I think Australia does do very well in the TVET sector. They have one of the most comprehensive TVET systems in the world. Um, the Australian skills um, skills system is something that has taken many years to develop, however, is actually very successful because of this policy, because they only allow certified people to be able to run um, and operate. Now, in Malaysia, I would say if we were to implement this policy immediately, a lot of our manufacturing would suffer. Now, I think it's a policy that needs to be done eventually so that we, we get the upskilling of all of our people done at a base level so that the entire Malaysian base can be upskilled because of needs. They need to upskill for them to get employed or for them to get projects. However, this needs to be done in a calculated move. It needs to be done in stages and maybe industry by industry so that it's not such a shock to the system. This, has, this is something that FMM, I believe, has been trying to, um, to implement. This is something that Malaysian uh, Human Resource Ministry has also been talking about for many years. But it's a shock to the system. And because of Malaysia is dependent on um, foreign labor, it is going to be something that, again, not impossible, but needs to be done in a very um, planned manner. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I also know how much it gets, how much you have to pay to get a locksmith to come and open your door. So if we are chasing for certified uh, 
uh, skills based workers then i think uh, as consumers we all should be willing to pay the price you know that cost exactly. of putting a plumber into your house so exactly. um, yeah there is pros and cons of this uh, if we are willing to uh, accept a high cost uh, living environment then of course we can make sure that everyone is certified um, yeah um, but nevertheless someday we'll have to cross paths and and try to do the right thing yeah uh, the next question is the curriculum the quality of curriculum and teaching may both be very important in tibet institutions i think we agree with that uh, what is the role of lecturers? Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I suppose we're trying to say maybe we can go wider than this question. You know, um, how do lecturers ensure uh, and how does the institution ensure that the lecturers um, um, know um, what to do um, uh, and to, to, um, to lead towards the end result of creating the right skills? Uh, in the graduates. Uh, maybe Sasha, you can also take this on. Um, yeah, because the question is not very clear, but I suppose um, what what are the key uh, responsibilities of lecturers to ensure the right skills are developed? I suppose that's what it should be. And how Happy does the institution, yeah, okay. Happy to, Dato, thank you. Um, lecturers, of course, are going to be the key cogs of any Tibet institution. Um, something that maybe maybe um, moving forward from this question, something that I can say has improved in the the TVET environment is with the introduction of COPTA, which is the streamlining of um, TVET and academics. The government has put in certain um, certain requirements for who a TVET lecturer could be. So they have in, um, ensured that they have these requirements of TVET lecturers having to have one level of education higher than what they are delivering. Now, this is something that MQA has always had, but TVET has not had that. It used to be uh, Sarata, which is leveled. If you are doing diploma, you have to have a diploma yourself. So now they've made it such that if you are teaching diploma, you need to have an advanced diploma or a degree, which makes sense. Something else that they have um, made quite good i think is they're not just taking the academic qualification into account but they're also looking at how much industry experience that person has now this i think is very valuable to a tvet environment because they are taking the person's knowledge and skills that they've actually take um, they've actually gained from being in the actual industry and the knowledge that they are able to give the students from there Something else that um, I think is quite interesting with regards to the role of lecturers in the TVET environment is they have added another clause where lecturers have to be um, to be exposed to actual industry. Every few years, they need to spend some time in the actual industry to kind of update them, their skills and knowledge, which I think is actually quite brilliant. This is something very on point and something much needed in um, the TVET scenario. I hope um, I've answered that question. Thank you. So, in other words, you're trying to say, um, Sasha, that COPTA, uh, under COPTA, there are various requirements that lecturers must meet, which includes um, uh, their certifications themselves, uh, you know, one level above what they're teaching, at least, and uh, also the, the right industry experience. Yeah. And uh, not only that, but they have to be continuously engaged with industry periodically. Yeah, um, on the on the MQA side, they have similar requirements, but not so much on the industry side. But you know, I, I strongly believe that you you can't have someone teaching anyone if he has not done the job before. Yeah, it will be rather odd, even on the academic side. And that's what I practice even in my own institution. Um, I'm told that 96 percent. Of my teaching staff are from industry, and uh, and we've always maintained that sort of ratio, uh, so that they know exactly uh, what to do. Uh, and they have also faced problems with uh, the lack of talent, the lack of the right skills in previous graduates. So they really know how to compensate for it. Okay, with that, you know, you're not going to believe it. We are on the dot at six o'clock, and uh, and two of you have managed to hold a fort. Uh, while Dr. Schroeder could not come online for some reason. Uh, and the number of questions uh, 
uh, were just right uh, for this. Um, Dr. Murray and Sasha, uh, can I, on behalf of the organizers, thank you uh, so much for having covered the session. Um, and like I said, um, two people have done the job of three people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I think we've, we've had a very um, uh, comprehensive um, coverage of EWET uh, within our session. And, um, and the good thing is we have finished just absolutely on time. Thank you once again and hope to meet you guys sometime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dato. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Mori. Very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Zatuk. Thank you, Ms. Sasha. Thank you, Torimakashi Junparagi. Thank you to the moderator and our two panelists for the discussion. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, the end of the discussion just now marks the end of day one for the seventh Global Higher Education Forum 2021. We hope that you have found today's presentations informative and useful. We are thankful to all guests and participants for spending your precious time with us today and we will be back tomorrow for more exciting presentations and discussion. Before that, please be reminded that the points are given for the session and the links are provided in the chat box. There are two links. One is for CPD points and the other one is for the certificate. The QR code will also be displayed on the screen for participants. Until we meet again tomorrow, be safe and have a nice day. Thank you.